Doctor of uh, visualizing, document and, uh, documenting, and exploring software architecture. And we're going to start here. So imagine we've invented teleporters, and I teleport you here. Where are you? France, close, but not quite. So yeah, it says La Rue, do something. This is what happens when we drop new joiners into a code base. We kind of drop them straight in the middle of it, and they're a bit lost. How do we solve this problem? How do we figure out where we are? We zoom out. We use technology, we open up the maps up on our, on our phone, and we start zooming out. Any better? Not zoomed out enough. We can now see the name of the road, but we're not quite sure still where we are. We zoom up one more time. Yeah, there we go. So there's Jersey. That's, that's where I live. There's a lot of cluttering on this map, isn't there? It's not very, very clear to see what's going on. So with things like Google Maps, we can reduce the amount of information. Like that. Gets a bit clearer. Now we can start to see some of the place names and, and where some of the bits and pieces are. If you've never heard of Jersey before, this is still kind of useless, so you have to pinch the zoom up one more time. And again. And again. So now there you go, there's Jersey. It's a small island just off the coast of France. Now, if you come and visit Jersey, which you should because it's lovely, uh, when you come through the airport, you'll get a map. And this is a traditional kind of uh, visitor map thing. And it shows you information like this. The map's broken up into four, into four quarters. And it kind of tells you enough information to get around. It tells you enough information to you know, go and find the major sites and that sort of thing. It doesn't tell you everything, though. It's not listing every street. It's not listing every building on every street, either. There's a zoom-in part for town, the main city. And we've got a little bit more detail on it, but there's still it's a it's a representation it's not quite accurate so this thing here this blue bit that the tide actually goes out there so if you if you pull into jersey in your boat and you park there you will find it dry at some point and also this bathing pool here it looks like it, it never gets refreshed with water but it does which is useful because i'm sure kids pee in it in the summer <laughs> the thing these maps have in common is that they show points of interest right so what do i really want to go and see when i visit jersey contrast this with like an ordnance survey map this is a very, very, uh, very, very detailed representation of Jersey. We've got contours and different types of land and all sorts of things going on here. And you need a bit of intelligence and, a, and a, you know, some help to get started interpreting this thing. Both maps are showing selected highlights as well. And, and that's a really interesting thing here, selected highlights. So when you come to Jersey next year on, on your summer holiday, you'll probably drive past this big castle. It's called Elizabeth Castle. It's on the south coast in the sea. And it's a you know, 16th century castle, some beautiful granite block work, and it was basically built to stop the French and the English taking Jersey over. And when you walk around this castle, we, you kind of get to the top and the middle, and things start to change. And you've got this like, beautiful granite stone thing with this weird concrete thing stuck on top for some reason. And you're like, that looks really weird. What's all that about? And, and history is important here. So when you're walking around the castle, it tells you that uh, in World War II, when the Germans occupied Jersey, they re-fortified some of the existing fortifications. So that's what that big concrete thing is on the top. And there's lots of gun emplacements and so on and so forth. Of course, all of this stuff is described in guidebooks. And there are lots of them out there. And of course, if you want to be a bit hipster, you can use the website. We have the internet now. So that's my quick introduction and sales pitch for Jersey, I guess. I'm going to come back to this later. Though. Right, so visualization. One of the things I do with software teams around the world is I, um, I run a, a visualization workshop. And we give people some requirements. So we say, right, you have 90 minutes in groups to go draw some pictures. And these are the types of pictures people actually draw. I promise I've not made any of these up. I'm not sure I could make these things up. Do these look like diagrams you see on your whiteboards? Yes. <laughs> I have another 15 gigabytes I could show you, but up I went. Sometimes when I'm, I'm running this workshop, I, I actually hear people say this, right? So they're drawing a box or a shape, and they say, this doesn't make sense, but we'll explain it later when we do our presentation or something. 
And that's fine, but we don't always present our diagrams, do we? You know, if we're drawing a picture of our, our system, we don't always stand there and present it. And, and a nasty trick I like to do is I like to have two teams swap diagrams. And guess what happens? Because they weren't part of that conversation, creating those diagrams, they have no idea what's going on. And they're this kind of whap moment. And they moan about the color coding and the shapes and the lines, and basically none of the notation elements make any sense whatsoever. When you ask people, you know, was this an easy exercise, they say, well, actually, yeah, it was. And then you say, well, why are your diagrams such a mess? They go, oh, yeah, good point. We don't really know what to draw. We're not sure what sort of diagrams we should draw. Uh, levels of detail, shapes, notation, should we use UML? Who here uses UML? That's a really small number, like four or five people. So what's everybody else doing? Something else. <laughs> I've, I've asked this question around the world, and, and UML is massively falling out of fashion. I have no evidence to back any of this up. This is all completely anecdotal, but um, I'm seeing more and more teams who have no UML skills in, in, in the uh, teams anymore. I do use UML, but I use it sparingly for small parts of a software system. Right, when I want to show a very small part of, say, a class, uh, class hierarchy or something. Google doesn't help. If you go to Google and ask it what it thinks a software architecture diagram looks like, you get this. Right, page after page after page of essentially pretty colored block pictures, the sort of things you can do in Visio or PowerPoint. Uh, and we laugh at these things, but these are exactly the type of diagrams I see when I go and visit organizations. You know, you open up their compliments pages or whatever, bang, you get this sort of stuff. And half the pictures just don't make any sense at all. This is hard. I think I've run this workshop for about 10,000 people now all around the world, and nobody does it sufficiently well first time around, believe it or not. And the irony here is Agile. So one of the great things Agile has done is it's made us more visual. Whenever I go and visit Agile organizations, you've got the Kanban boards and the story walls and the information dashboards. So we've got awesome at visualizing, essentially, process and the way we work. We, we've totally forgotten how to draw stuff, you know, draw pictures of the things we're building. And this is just about good communication. You know, if you want to move fast as a team, if you want business agility, then you need to communicate well. That's it. So there are some, some really simple tips here around notation that I can give you. And you know, it's just stuff like put titles and pictures, make sure your arrows are uh, annotated, make sure your arrows point one way, and so on and so forth. And, and the notation around drawing architecture diagrams is really, really easy to fix. One of my key points is this one here, responsibilities. We often joke that naming is hard in software, so it doesn't make sense that most of our architecture diagrams are essentially just a collection of named boxes, because the diagrams contain a, a huge amount of ambiguity. So my simple tip is add more text to your diagrams. And here's a really simple example. This is the same diagram. The version on the right has more text. And that, more, that additional text allows us to see things like the responsibilities of those building blocks. There's a lot more information there. In terms of content, you know, when we're drawing uh, architecture diagrams, you can't show everything on a single picture. And this is why people do talk about things like views and viewpoints and perspectives. And there are lots and lots of different ways to do this. Uh, Owen mentioned Philip Critchen's 4 plus 1 model. Uh, Owen ha has a book that details um, uh, a whole bunch of ways to do this. And there are more. The thing is, all of those view catalogs have this logical view of a system separate to the development view of the system. So the, the logical view is often you know, the functional, logical, conceptual building blocks, and then there's something else that refers to how we're building these things. Why? Why do we do this? I don't get it. Because whenever I go to organizations and I see their nice, fluffy, logical architecture diagrams, they never match the code. And that's kind of the point here. If I'm drawing architecture diagrams, I need them to match the code, otherwise they're just lying to me. George Fairbanks is sitting in the back. He calls this the model of code gap in his, in his awesome book. When we're having an architecture discussion, we're using abstract concepts like uh, modules and components and services, but we don't have those same, same things in our programming languages. Quick show of hands, who's a Java developer here? Right, so in Java, is there a layer keyword? No. In Java, is there a component keyword? No, but we create components of layers by assembling classes and interfaces and packages and things together. 
So what I'm trying to get to is a set of diagrams that accurately reflect the code here. That's my, my ultimate goal. Before we can even attempt to solve this problem, we have a bigger problem. And that is a lack of any sort of consistent standard language. Yeah, even in 2016, we don't have a consistent vocabulary to talk about software architecture. We think we do, but I don't think we do. Quiz time, what's this? It's a map of London, right. What's the blue thing? It's a river, it's the River Thames. What is a river? Body of water flowing one or, or other direction, perfect. So we know what a river is, and we can go and find other rivers using our knowledge. What's that? So a floor plan for a bathroom. What's this thing here? It's a toilet, what is a toilet? Right, you know what a toilet is. And again, we could use the, our knowledge of what a toilet is to go and find more toilets. Any electrical people here, electrical engineers? A couple of ways to refer to um, circuit diagrams. You've got a funny cartoony pictorial thing or a schematic version. What's that squiggly line there at the bottom? It's a resistor, what's a resistor? It resists stuff, it slows current down or something, yeah. If I had a box of electrical components here at the front with capacitors and switches and resistors, could you come to the front and find me a resistor in that box? Right, so you know how to identify a resistor in it. If you know the color coding, you can work out how strong it is. Right, this quiz is too easy. Let's ramp up the complexity on an exponential scale. What's that? So we have two UML component diagrams. One is a 1.x version, one is a 2.x version. Uh, don't ask me which one's which, I've forgotten. What are the boxes on these diagrams? They are components, correct. What is a component? I don't know. It's a logical, abstract, functional building block thing. And, and these components are all very different. So this one down here is, an, is a stereotyped database, and there's a JDBC interface. So that sounds like a database component. These ones are UIs or applications. What's the stuff in the middle? Business components, where do they run? In the database as part of the app? Are they microservices? This diagram is open to lots and lots of interpretation. Look, more text on diagram. If, if this diagram had more text, at least we'd know what these things were. To put this very, very simply, imagine we're building a really simple system consisting of a web app and a database. The word component means part of. For some people, the web app is a component of the entire system. For others, something like a login component is a component of the web app. Same word, different levels of abstraction. It's the ubiquitous language thing. Now, we've been going on for years about DDD and having this ubiquitous language between us and the business people. We don't have that ubiquitous language for ourselves, and that's the problem we, we need to solve here. UML tried to do too much. It was a standard notation and a standard set of abstractions, and it kind of failed on both counts. And I think for where we are currently in the industry, we need that standard set of abstractions. I would like to get to something like electrical engineering in the future, so we have a standard set of funny symbols to represent things, but let's get the language nailed first. And, and the thing here is that the language we create needs to reflect the technology that we're using. So I want to merge the logical and development views back together again, collapse them, so we have real terminology that maps to real technology. Now, I don't know how we do this on a global scale, but what we can do within the boundaries of this room is I can show you how I do this. And for me, very simply, when I'm discussing what a software system, that software system is made up of containers. A container is just something that stores data or runs code. In real terms, it's a web app, a mobile app, a standalone app, a Windows service, a database schema, and so on. If you open up the containers, they are made up of components. So I want to use the word component to mean something running inside a runtime environment, essentially. It's a, a nice cohesive grouping of stuff with a nice clean interface, and we're done. And because I mostly deal with Java and C-sharp, my components are built from classes. That's it. It's a really simple hierarchical tree structure to describe the static structure of a software system. If you're using JavaScript, this makes no sense. So maybe it's modules and objects, or modules and functions. Uh, same with functional languages, modules and functions. If you're using a database technology, maybe it's uh, components and stored procedures. So again, you have to take the same hierarchical approach and map it to the tech that you're using. 
And this is really about creating a, a single, simple, static model of a software system, from the system as a black box down to the code with a couple of levels in between. So that's the language defined. And once you define a language, you can draw some diagrams really simply. And, and this is what I often refer to as my, my C4 model. It's a context diagram. You zoom in to see the containers. You zoom in to see the components. And you can go down to code if you want to. But I don't normally do this, especially if I'm trying to describe an existing code base, for example. Really quick example. Um, I created a site called Tech Tribes when I moved back to Jersey. And it's just a simple content aggregator for the local tech industry. Uh, this is a context diagram for tech tribes. The thing with the monkey is the system I built. There are different types of users and different system dependencies. If this was an interactive Google map, we could select, pinch to zoom in. We see the containers inside the system boundary. We select a container. We pinch to zoom in. We show the components inside it, and so on and so forth. It's just a really simple set of hierarchical diagrams that map onto that language. And ultimately, we get to the code. And ultimately, ideally, there's a nice clean mapping between all of these layers, and, and this actually does reflect what the code looks like. So for me, diagrams are maps. Right, that's a summary of all of this stuff. Basically, diagrams are maps. And you need different types of maps depending on how much information you have about the thing you want to learn about or the audience that you're speaking to. So business people, non-technical people, a nice high-level view works well. Me as a developer, something low level, maybe some operations people, something in the middle. I don't want you to take away um, any tips around notation. This is the notation I use just because it's very, very simple. And I tend to use things like uh, color coding and shapes to supplement an existing diagram that already makes sense. So this is the same diagram. Um, one version has some shapes. Which one do you prefer? probably the one with the shapes. But fundamentally, there's no more information on either diagram. It's just an aesthetic thing. I also um, think it's worth just pointing out that there are lots of other things you might want to consider when you're describing your software architecture. And this is where all of the views and viewpoints and perspective stuff comes into play. And, and I will point you at Philip Christian's work as well and Owen Woods' book. This C4 thing is not a design process. It's just a set of diagrams. And it's a set of diagrams that you can use um, during an upfront design exercise, or even retrospectively. So if you have an existing code base with no documentation, this is a really good starting point. Yes. <laughs> I get this question a lot. What tooling do you recommend? Please don't say Visio again. <laughs> because this is just a set of boxes and lines, any general purpose diagramming tool will do. Visio, OmniGraphle, Gliffy, whatever you choose. But come on, this is 2016. There was an interesting um, plea for help on Twitter recently. Uh, what, what tools are there for creating architecture slides? Nobody responded with a modeling tool. It was all general purpose diagramming tools, which I think is just nuts. And if you look at the building industry, the building industry does not use Visio. The building industry creates a, a three-dimensional model of their building, and they surface different views from it. The irony, again, of course, is we build these tools for the building sector. <laughs> and we can't do this ourselves. So I'm trying to solve lots of problems here. And, and um, one of my approaches to this is a, a set of tooling called Structurizer. Uh, Structurizer is um, part it's kind of SaaS product, part open source. In its very simplest form, you can write a simple domain-specific language to create some diagrams. So this is really just an implementation of the people, software systems, containers, components thing I briefly showed you before. It's like web sequence diagrams, if you've seen that. This is great for sketching up something small and simple, a single diagram at a time, but it's not really where we want to go. If I have an existing code base, why can't I just auto-generate diagrams? Has anybody tried this? <laughs> what happens? You just get chaos. Is that because your code base is chaos? Sometimes, but often not. Often it's just showing too much detail. So one of the things I've done recently with Structurizer, so Structurizer is all cloud-based, uh, and lots of my potential customers like it, but they don't want to send their software architecture models up to the cloud. So I've built a very simple on-premises API. Because, Structur is, uh, because Structurizer is essentially um, a JavaScript app running in the browser, if you install an API that you can reach locally, you can store the data locally. It's about less than a 1,000 lines of code. 
Um, and this is what that code looks like if you auto-generate a UML class diagram in some tooling. It's not particularly useful, is it? It's showing us all of the code-level elements and all of the relationships between them. And it's hard to really pick out what the important parts of this code base are. And this is a really, really small app, like less than 1,000 lines of, of code. What happens if you point this at 100,000 or a million lines of code? You just get crazy, crazy diagrams. And the reason is that these diagramming tools see codes, not components. These diagramming tools are usually unable to zoom up to show you bigger abstractions. It's essentially uh, the model code gap thing again. And we can trace this problem right back in time. There was a paper about the, this problem in the, in the 90s. The first two opening paragraphs basically say, if you ask an engineer to draw a picture of their software system, you get a nice high-level view. If you reverse engineer a diagram from the code, you get something totally, totally different. The reverse engineer diagram is super accurate, of course, but it's not how the engineer thinks about the world. And it all comes back to this question, well, what is a component? If I, if I want to draw a component diagram, I need to understand what a component is. And if we go back to my little class diagram here, these two boxes I've highlighted are really what I consider to be the components in this little API app I've built. There's a Java servlet handling API requests, and there's a, a workspace component that's dealing with the structurizer workspaces. You've heard of serverless? This is frameworkless. <laughs> this is like the simplest implementation you could possibly write. And, and all of these other code things are just parts of those two components. And again, this is what the code structure looks like. So I've got two major components with a bunch of helper code, essentially. Now, we often say that the code is a single point of truth. The code is the final embodiment of all the architectural ideas. Can we get that information back out of an existing code base? And the answer is not really. So if, if you were to give me your code base, could I generate something like a context diagram automatically by looking for references to people and software systems in your code base? And the answer is no, because they don't really exist. We don't have this information in our code bases much of the time. The same with containers. Can I get a list of the containers just by scraping data from your code base? Uh, there's some information in there, but it's kind of hard to find. When I get down to the component level, this is really the level I want to generate automatically because it's the most volatile and it changes the most frequently. George Fairbanks to the rescue. George Fairbanks says we should ad adopt an architecturally evident coding style. Anybody doing this? You should. It's a really, oh, George is fantastic. So it's a really, really simple technique. And it, it's, it's simply about embedding information into your code base so that your code base reflects your architectural ideas and intent. This sounds very kind of high level and, and waffly. In concrete terms, it's just stuff like naming conventions. So if you have a logging component on your architecture diagram, make sure there's something in your code base called a logging component. Maybe it's about a namespacing or packaging convention. You know, one folder, one namespace, one package per box on the diagram. Or maybe it's machine-readable metadata, annotating stuff to be, this is important, this is a component, for example. And, and, and by using this, we can then extract really useful information from a code base and supplement it where that information is not possible. And I want to move away from drawing diagrams in Visio. There's something called an architecture description language. I'm guessing no one's ever heard of it and no one's ever used it. And it's because it's never really entered mainstream industry. But an architecture description language is essentially a textual description of, say, the static structure of a software system. There are a bunch of them out there, Darwin or Koala, for example. But the syntaxes are horrible. And you have to teach developers another weird looking language just so they can describe the piece of software that they're building. But this is a fantastic concept because we're not dealing with pictures, we're dealing with text. And as developers, we like text. We can diff text, we have tooling to support text. So let's take all of these things, chuck them in a pot, stir it around, and come up with an architecture, architecture description language using code, using general purpose code, the same code we're using to build our systems. And that's the other piece of Structurizer. So there are two open source libraries. And basically, they are a, a, a very small implementation of the C4 stuff. Again, there's a bunch of classes in both, uh, one for Java, one for .NET. And, and they let you create people and software systems and containers and components and wire them together to describe your software architecture. So let's have a go at using this for describing my little API thing. So as a user, a person, 
the person, the software developer, is using my Structurizer product, and Structurizer uses the API to, to, to store information locally. So again, we can just write up some code to create that little model. And then I can create a system context view by adding the appropriate things to my, to my diagram. And the net result is very simply, you get a picture like this from code like this. So it's a very, very simple way to describe the high-level structures of a software system. We go down to containers, it's just the same deal. So from a container perspective, essentially all, all I have is a, a little API server. It's a web app, it's a Java web app, um, storing information on a file system. So again, we can create a couple of containers. We wire them together, just using some method calls, and we can create some diagrams. So basically, you write code to get pictures. This is great for the high-level stuff. Once you get down to components, you don't want to have to do that. So this is why the open source libraries have some component finder things in. And the component finders find components. And see, naming is not hard after all. Now, now the question becomes, how do you find components? And the answer is, it's up to you. Because every code base is different. And this comes back to the architecturally evident coding style thing. So if you have a naming convention that your team's adopted, you can go and find components based upon that naming convention. If you've used um, a framework like Spring, you can go and find Spring annotations and call them components, uh, and so on and so forth. So there are lots of different strategies you can plug in to find components. This is the code I use um, to find the components in my little API application. Got a couple of different strategies here. I want to find the things ending with the word servlet, and I want to find the things that I've annotated with my own special at component annotation find them, wire them together, and, and actually there's some, some, some logic behind the scenes in the framework that goes and finds the inter-component dependencies. And that's the sort of diagram you get from that. So that's the API servlet component that it found, and that's the workspace component, and it's identified the relationship between them. You might be wondering, how did that text get on there? And the answer is you have to add some more metadata to your code base to do that. This is really about creating a model. So I want to get people away from using diagrams and back to using modeling as an approach for describing software. And because once you have a model, you can do lots of really interesting things, like generate diagram keys automatically. Yay. No more horrible notation we don't understand. Because this is a, a, a model, we can do things like hyperlink the model to the code. So if you go online and you find these diagrams, you can double click any of the components. It takes you right to GitHub. It takes you to the exact um, implementation of that thing. And again, it comes back to the maps thing, right? Diagrams and maps. This is a funny tweet. <laughs> 388,000 pixel wide picture. My, my, my reason for including this tweet is basically, does such an approach scale? And the answer is no if you use it naively. So this is what happened when I threw my own tooling at one of my own web apps. All of these things are web app controllers and these things are components. My goodness, it's horrible. I don't think the code's horrible. The diagram is horrible. And of course, making the diagram canvas larger does not help one bit because you still have the mess. It's just spread out. But because this is a model, you can do some interesting things like, don't show me everything. Show me a slice through the system. So for example, we can say, what's a slice? Well, maybe it's a slice starting from a web app controller and entry point to your system. And show me that slice until you drop out the bottom of the app. So basically, you can create a larger number of much, much simpler pictures. So that's my approach for dealing with um, complexity and scale. P once you have a model, you can throw it into lots of other types of tooling. So if you're a graph biz fan, part of the uh, Java open source library is a graph biz exporter. So that it creates a dot file. You throw a dot file into graph biz, it auto generates diagrams for you. If you hook all of this stuff up to your build process, guess what happens? Your documentation, your diagrams remain up to date when your code changes. And that's ultimately what I'm trying to get to here. So the title of this talk was Visualize Document Explore. So we should talk about documentation really quickly. Um, a lot of people are no longer documenting anything. I know that sounds a bit extremist. Uh, we have our friend the Agile Manifesto to thank for that. It's, or rather, people's misinterpretation of what the Agile Manifesto says about documentation. And of course, if I did drop you into a project that's unfamiliar to you, a code base that you've never seen before, you do get that kind of, where am I in this leafy lane? And you have to start zooming around and exploring and trying to figure out where you are. And this takes time. 
that lane I dropped you in right at the start, you could keep walking until you met somebody and ask them, where am I? Where's the nearest X, for example? But it's just going to take some time. And of course, once you're exploring the code base, the code base actually doesn't tell you everything you want to know. The code doesn't tell you the entire story, especially around things like rationale and intent. You know, why were these decisions made? That's often missing from the code base. And often teams have lots of tribal knowledge kicking around as well. You know, specialisms and experts in particular parts of the code base. And that's fine until those people leave or they get run over by the proverbial London bus. The thing is, the bus factor, as we call it, is not just about buses. You know, imagine you have a small team here. One does get run over by a double-decker bus. Bye-bye. Someone goes on sabbatical for a year, and we have to fire somebody because they're useless. And now we have a smaller team, and the smaller team starts saying things like, you know that thing there that we have to run every week? What is it? Oh. Right? And, it, and again, that's a kind of extreme thing, but that I, I, I have seen situations like that occur. So how do we fix our documentation problems? Will we write some documentation? And this is where the sad comes into play. And it's called the sad because it makes you sad. And there are lots of templates out there for this sort of thing. Uh, every consulting company I've ever worked at has created their own. Uh, RUP has one. There, there are lots of them out there. And these sort of software architecture documents normally include some really interesting, insightful information. How do we get to the design? What were the design decisions? What is the architecture? How do we look after it? But these documents tend to be just horrible. Hundreds of pages. Use, you know, out of date totally. Useless. So how do we fix this? Well, it turns out naming is our friend. What I do is I just rename the document and all the problems go away. <laughs> and I call it a guidebook. Like the Jersey guidebook thing I talked about at the start. You know, if you, go, if you come to Jersey, you buy a guidebook, it has a bunch of maps to help you navigate an unfamiliar environment. It shows you the sites and the itineraries, the points of interest, the things you really should come and see. It talks about the history and the culture. How did Jersey get to where it is today? And there's all the practical stuff. And again, if you take that metaphor and apply it to a software system, you get a really, really interesting set of documentation. So maps, the diagrams, you know, show me what the code looks like. How do we explore the code base? Which parts of the code base are useful to understand? Which parts are important? Because most stuff isn't. How did the code base evolve to where it is today? And how do we look after it? This is my single tip for documentation. Just describe what you can't get from the code base. That's it. It's as simple as that. All right. Knock it up a level of, of abstraction. And make these things small. You know, don't have hundreds and hundreds of pages of stuff that becomes out of date. You know, make these things as small and lean as possible. They're really kind of living, breathing, evolving style documents. This isn't a big upfront design, we must create a sad upfront sort of approach. This is a, a supplementary piece of documentation that sits alongside the code base. And it's a product related document. A software system, a document, a supplementary document. This doesn't mean you can't do project documentation as well, but every software system should have a user guide, essentially. How does the software work? <sighs> you choose. I don't care. It's the tooling thing again. You know, what tooling do you recommend for documents? A lot of people still use Word. That's fine. SharePoint if you really have to. Uh, lots of people are using Confluence. But I'm seeing more and more teams adopt things like Ask Your Docker Markdown. And they're creating nice little, um, you know, documentation files and they're sticking the documentation files next to the source code in source code control. And then they do stuff at build time, you know, generate HTML, upload them to websites and wikis and so on. So there's a, a, a lot of opportunities for, for using different tooling here. And again, that's something I'm trying to do with Structurize. I want to create a software architecture model that contains both the model, the visualization stuff, and the documentation. So this is the code I wrote to document my little API application. It's a bunch of simple markdown files. You upload it as part of the model, and some documentation is basically generated for you. That's it. So again, I'm trying to keep all of this stuff in one place. And you can also embed diagrams in your documentation. So again, these things are together where they belong. There are some other approaches to documentation. Um, so uh, this guy's doing lots of really interesting stuff around living documentation. He's got a whole bunch of little tools. Um, uh, open source on GitHub that you can use for creating documentation from code, for example. Uh, and these guys in Germany um, have a, a, 
a software architecture document they call ARC42. And it's a really, really nice, lightweight, lean approach to documenting software systems. It's very similar to the uh, approach I, I typically take. Uh, and there's lots of content, lots of free content that you can grab on ARC42. People say, how long should a document be? And, and that's the wrong question to ask. Right? How many pages is the wrong question to ask. If I join your team, what I'm really looking for is a document I can consume in like one or two hours over a coffee or two to get a good jump off point into the code so I can go and explore in a much more structured way, much more structured manner. And speaking of exploring, once you start to model your software, you can do some really interesting stuff with it. So you can do things like you know, create a JavaScript D3 visualization of the static elements. It's just a tree structure. So this is a, a model of a, one of the uh, sample applications from the Spring team. It's called the Spring Pet Clinic. And this is just the software system containers components. You can do things like, let's find all of the interesting component dependencies, you know, incoming and, and outgoing dependencies. You can do things like, let's rate our components based on size or complexity. So again, once you have a model, you can do some cool stuff with it. You can throw it into Neo for j if you really want to. Why not? You know, the, the software architecture model is just a directed graph. You throw it into Neo for j you can query it with Cypher. Right? People are actually doing this. The, there's, a, there's a whole set of tooling called JQ Assistant that lets you do this. You run it against your source code, you set up some rules, and basically it pops it into Neo behind the scenes. It's awesome. Uh, and these guys, Empire, um, they've created a set of tooling that runs against your source code repositories. And not only are they doing static analysis, but they're also superimposing the human aspects on top as well. So they can look for things like, we have this one thing here, and it's always changed by these two different teams. Why is that? You know, maybe we've got the, the component boundaries incorrect in this particular instance. So again, there's some really cool technology there. In summary, there was a, a virtual panel about software architecture documentation from 2009. Um, some people you might know on here, Owen Woods on here, of course. And it says things like, we should be able to see the architecture in the code. We should be able to embed this information in the code. We should be able to get the documentation from a click of a button, for example. You know, it's really about automating as much as documentation <coughs> as possible. I don't think we're there yet, but I think we can get there, and we are starting to get there, of course. My summary is really that diagrams and maps. Treat your software architecture diagrams as a set of simple maps that describe your code base at different levels of abstraction. Any documentation you create should describe what the code doesn't. It's as simple as that. And yeah, the 1990s called and they want their tooling back. <laughs> right, so stop using Visio. Please stop using Visio. And if you're going to say, ah, we don't use Visio, we use Gliffy, it's the same thing. Stop using that as well. Stop manually drawing boxes and lines to describe software architecture. All of the tooling aside, my final closing comment is very, 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 very simple. Whenever you're describing software, make sure within your team you have a ubiquitous language to do so. That's me. Thank you very much. <laughs>